uh, I'd like to speak a, a little bit directly to the appearance of Birkata Kohanim in Birkata Shachar. Uh, so one reason people often don't know where this is in the prayer book is that you have to be there super, super early to, uh, to hear it. And I grew up in a tr- traditional synagogue. I was never there early and only began attending services when they actually began with Birkot HaShachar, when I joined the library minion at Beth Am in Los Angeles. And the room had not even a minion there. And the person who was uh, leading Birkot HaShachar was not, not only not the chazim, but also not the chazim sheni. It was a lay person. And there was something beautiful about a still nearly empty room, uh, still a little bit cold from the morning. And I remember uh, sitting by myself and just loving Birkota Shachar, the early morning blessings. So, of course, this, uh, this is where, uh, in the early morning blessings, is where we have these three levels, the citation from the Torah, Birkata Kohanim, the citation from the Mishnah that was just read, and from the Gomorrah that was just read. So I looked up the source of it. And the source of it was that we're supposed to study a little bit of Torah every day, a little bit of Mishnah every day, and a little bit of Gemara, of Talmud every day. And so the rabbis asked, well, can we put this in the prayer book? So every person who gets up and just says the early morning blessings, they're all already was called Yotze, which means they fulfilled their op- religious obligation to study Torah and Mishnah, meaning the first ancient code of Jewish law, and the Gemara, which is the great, as it were, digressive, stupendous, imaginative expansion of the Mishnah. So instead of our trying to figure out which part of the Torah should I read, which part of the Mishnah should I read, what part of the Gomorrah, they, they answered it for us. And what they chose are three things that have a kind of an infinity to them. So I'll start with the last one, uh, Talmud Torah Kened Kulam. The study of Torah is equal to them all, parentheses, because it leads to them all. Uh, meaning, if you don't meditate, consider, contemplate a life of goodness, it's much like, less likely that you will achieve it because you don't have a thought-out system. You don't actually have anything like a vision or a plan. So the study of Torah for, for me means if you want to live any kind of life where you're striving to the good, whether it's actually the moral good, the spiritual good, connection to God, or any of the great midot, spiritual qualities that we should all master, you have to think about it. So the study of the teaching, in a way, is equivalent to the teaching. It's a bit of an overstatement, but you understand it. If we move one back, it says, these are mitzvahs that have no measure. So, as was discussed, that how much of the corner of the field do I, uh, do I leave to the poor? There's actually no measure. So there are certain things where the Bible, the rabbis, don't actually give the measure, uh, and one of them is the study of Torah, which means... Even if you only study these three passages, you have fulfilled your religious obligation. Not only is there no expansive measure, there's not even really that much of a minimum. You just do this, you're good to go. Now we go to the first of the three, which is Birkat Tekoni. So I want to talk a little bit about what a blessing is and segue to my topic for tonight and tomorrow, my my core topic for tonight and tomorrow. Uh, Going back to the Time, the first time the term is used in Genesis, when God says, and he blessed uh, the human being, saying, be fruitful and multiply. For me, to bless here mean, means clearly, uh, but this is just me, I'm not saying it's a dictionary definition, to, um, to uh, uh, empower, to provide with some kind of vitality that can create and empower other beings in other worlds. So the power of the human being to uh, procreate uh, comes from this blessing that, as it were, empowers us to do something of great creativity. The next time the word is is used was Shabbat. And I believe that uh, everything before the institution of Shabbat, that that we just read before the Kiddush, I believe that was the point of the story of creation, and then everything went backwards from there, which means... When God blesses the human beings with this power, it's a way to lead us into the true power when God blesses the Sabbath. What can it possibly mean for God to bless the Sabbath? Well, for me, it's quite clear. God invested the Sabbath with power. The power to transform, the power to cause us in this day of rest, 
but not a day of absence of labor. Certainly in the tradition where there's, there's no malacha, there's no physical labor. There's a different kind of labor called avodat hanefesh, the labor of the soul. In fact, some sidorim are called avodat hanefesh, the avodah, which means work, but it also means worship. So avodat hanefesh as opposed to avodat haguf, the, the work of the body. So try to imagine that the Sabbath has a kind of power to produce vitality or life in those who observe the Sabbath. So the Sabbath, as it were, is a power that's waiting for you to show up. So how do you show up to the Sabbath? I'm not orthodox, I don't preach orthodoxy, but I know that showing up for the Sabbath is not simply abstaining from the prohibitions and engaging in the mitzvot ase, in the mitzvahs that we're supposed to do. That does not invest it with power because you don't have to be a highly spiritually conscious person to not do some things and do other things. There has to be great intentionality uh, involved. So I'm one of those who believes that all of the mitzvot uh, have a tam, have a reason, have a, a, a goal in them. Some say that, uh, that there are no reasons for some commandments. There are just things that God gives us so we can multiply commandments. That, that's a very valid view. The other view that goes along with Maimonides is they all have a purpose. So what is the purpose of the prohibitions and the mitzvot ase, the mitzvot that we're supposed to do on Sabbath, in order for us to be able to receive the power of the Sabbath? So it's as if you have to clear your consciousness in order to experience this transformative power. So I like to remind people that the Hebrew word minucha, rest, I loved it when I discovered this, has the same shorash as the Hebrew word tinucha, which can mean a yoga pose. So here's in the word, in the word repose, which means someone resting. So try to imagine that the re- repose on the Sabbath is just not lollygagging about and not doing anything, try to imagine that it's a yoga pose. That you, you move your soul in such a way, I remember when I took yoga, they said, let the gravity do the work. Don't stretch, don't push, hold the pose, and just feel your whole body loosen. Don't make it happen, let it happen. And I remember uh, when I started yoga because of a, a bad back injury, so I went to the uh, rehabilitative yoga class, I never taken yoga before, and it really worked. It, it kept me out of back surgery for many, many years that I went into these tunuchot, a wonderful teacher, a very, very spiritual person, but she didn't lord it over us, that we, we went into a pose, and she said, just don't stretch, don't put effort, just let it do its work. And something glorious would open up in me. And sometimes when I would be in that pose and it's as if my body just relaxed and my spirit could take over, one image that constant, constantly came up to me was standing on the beach and watching the sunset. I think that's clearly a reference to the beach in Tel Aviv because, of course, the uh, sun sets in the west. And I remember being on the, uh, on the promenade in Tel Aviv and looking over this beautiful view and watching the, uh, the sun dip beyond the horizon. And these were just very deep moments for me uh, where the, the, the sun would blaze and then sink and disappear and the stars would come out. And I remember thinking, I think that's what life it is going to be. Meaning, there's going to be a day when I, all of us, are going to be standing in the blazing sun. And the sun is going to slowly set. And when our sun sets, the stars blaze, and we join the stars. And that image of that, that tenucha, that, that rest, and I, I, remember, I remember myself thinking, and I'm okay with that. I'm really okay with going from the blazing sun to the sunset, to the sun sinking beyond the horizon into the ocean, that's what it looked like, and watching the stars appear. Now, that's a kind of a feeling, and there's many more that I can share with you, that for me leads to a kind of Shabbat. So it's the power of acceptance and the power of a sense of oneness with everything. I want to remind you, 
whenever I share one of these epigrams, um, the oneness of everything, the power of acceptance, that's not the only epigram. I mean, there are many, many things that I say, and one is not truer than the other. <clears throat> For example, the, fa- the famous prayer, uh, the famous, uh, I'll say prayer said at 12 set meetings, uh, we ask uh, uh, the courage to change what we can, uh, the serenity for what we can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. People call it the serenity prayer, but it's actually not a serenity prayer, it's a courage prayer, a serenity prayer, and a wisdom prayer. Now, what's the wisdom? Sometimes be courageous, sometimes be serene. Well, how do you know which is which? That goes back to the study of Torah. Many times in counseling, a person says to me, but Rabbi Finley, how do you know when? So sometimes I, again, if I feel free to do so, I say, let me find the cliff notes on life where it has outlined every situation, no matter what you're in, when you know when this rule moves into this rule. And they say, okay, I get it. There's no rule book. There's no cliff notes to life. How do you learn the wisdom of life? You live enough life with reflection, with wisdom. And this is where the idea of blessing comes in. Um, you, you, whenever I think of being blessed with something material, and people use that, I've lived a very blessed life, they oftentimes mean my material goods were taken care of. And that's one of, one of the interpretations, by the way, of Birkat Kohanim is, may God bless you with material things, okay, uh, and may God guard you from them, from the material things, from taking them too seriously. Because there are many people who are seeking the blessings of prosperity, which the Torah is very serious about, and then that seeking of prosperity sometimes leads to that moment when one has a, enough prosperity, but sometimes emptiness because one has not worked on being spiritually fulfilled, being intimate with one's own soul. So there's a nice interpretation that Nechama Leibowitz gives, may God give you prosperity and guard you from it. I like that, but I'm going to go to something deeper. What's the greatest gift a blessing can give us? Is the bless of a kind of a power. Um, and what's this power? Uh, as I, I shared my, at my thought, Shabbat thought a little bit of this, but there's one thing that's been coming up to me, and I mentioned it at other sessions, and sometimes when I repeat something uh, more than a few times in a given couple months of counseling, it's something I, I, I need to share. And I'll repeat the anecdote. Uh, a, a person complained, a woman complained that she didn't feel spiritually spiritual intimacy with her husband. I mean, they loved each other dearly, and they got along well, and she said, something's missing. And I, we talked a little bit, and I said, I'm going to ask you a question, and please don't be hurt by it, but I would rather I take the direct approach or the roundabout approach. She says, take the direct approach. I said, do you have intimacy with yourself? Because if we don't have intimacy with our own souls, are we, do we have the power, as it were, to be intimate with the souls of others. And no matter what they do, if we don't ha- have intimacy with our own souls, how can another person be intimate with our soul? So I, I-, I said to her, and-, and by the way, she took it very gracefully. I said, work on intimacy with your own soul. And again, I shared a moment with you, looking at the sunset and thinking of my life wrapping up and being okay with it. That was an intimate soul moment. And there's a sense of acceptance and oneness. And so I think part of a, a, a really good relationship is there's an acceptance. I, I'm like this, they're like that, here's how we are. We're gonna try to work it through. I'm not gonna be mad, I'm not gonna pray for someone thinking to be different and hope for something to be different and think about how things should be. I'm just gonna love this moment. I'm gonna accept this. And feel one with this other person, one with all, as a, as a temporary thing, as a phase, You rest in it, and there's something very powerful, very, very powerful in acceptance, in that rest of joining the stars, as it will. You sink into yourself, and then you come back, and you start to work on life's problems. So when I think of the blessing, I think of the blessing of Shabbat, which is a kind of power, God blessed the Sabbath, which means invested it with power. How do we receive the power of the Sabbath? Putting aside the rituals, we have to clear our consciousness for the power of the Shabbat pose, the yoga of Shabbat 
to enter us. And when we observe the yoga of Shabbat, it's a yoga of the spirit, not of the body. When we observe the yoga of Shabbat, the power suffuses our being. There's a kind of a, 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 an inner birthing that takes place. The world looks different. You, se- you center deep into yourself. You can experience the souls of others. You have a little bit of detach- detachment from always working to an outcome and having a sense of your soul being at rest. So uh, the main thing I wanted to communicate to you in thinking about a blessing and the priestly blessing, the first word, may God bless you, imagine that just as God blessed the Sabbath with power, God is empowering you to do something. And on Shabbat we think that the divine is empowering us to create for ourselves Moments of rest, of wisdom, of acceptance, of centeredness. We can take the Shabbos breath and then go back into life and take care of what needs to be taken care of, but with a kind of Shabbos blessing consciousness.